Welcome to this, the second video in a series of lectures on Of Mice and Men, going through the novella chronologically and dealing with some of the themes and ideas that Steinbeck explores through the story as we go. This second lecture is all about an unusual friendship and introducing George and Lenny as characters. In our first session, we looked at the setting and how it seems as though it's almost a corrupted Eden, a, a place that has promise and hope and, and optimism, California, the Golden State, uh, but also a place that is, is corrupted by uh, the wider social landscape in which it, men were uh, forced to move from place to place in search of work. Well, Lenny's companionship is at odds with the world of, of mice and men. In a place of extreme hardship where men are forced to drift aimlessly from ranch to ranch with no real sense of security or stability, the idea of dependency and friendship is a totally alien concept. We see this in the initial reactions to George and Lenny's relationship when they arrive on the ranch. We see it too in both Candy and George's perceptions of value as opposed to those who view worth through a lens of productivity. And finally, we see that for all the confidence we have in this wholesome and genuine partnership, there is uncertainty there, a sense of foreboding that points us towards the novella's inevitable conclusion. We will therefore explore three things. Firstly, the initial reactions to George and Lenny's relationship. Secondly, Candy and George's unique understanding of value. And finally, our uncertain confidence in the friendship's longevity. First then, let's have a look at three initial reactions to George and Lenny's relationship in the second chapter of the novella. Let's read this section where the boss confronts them. The boss deliberately put the little book in his pocket. He hooked his thumbs in his belt and squinted, one eye nearly closed. Say, what you selling? Huh? I said, what stake you got in this guy? You taking his pay away from him? No, of course I ain't. Why you think I'm selling him out? Well, I never seen one guy take so much trouble for another guy. I'd just like to know what your interest is, George said. He's my cousin. The boss assumes some sort of financial foul play here. Exploitation is the only possible justification for connection of this kind. It's telling, isn't it, how the bemusement at George and Lenny's relationship transcends social boundaries. Not only the boss, but his son, who we'll look at in a second, and Slim, later even Crooks, struggle to come to terms with the friendship. George desperately reaches for an acceptable justification and the only viable excuse is that they're related because their friendship is so unusual otherwise in a world where survival is their number one priority. Why would you look out for somebody else? Why would you have a dependent? Secondly, let's have a look at Curly's first reaction. Curly lashed his body around. By Christ, he's got to talk when he spoke to. What the hell are you getting into it for? We travel together, said George coldly. Oh, so it's that way. George was tense and motionless. Yes, that way. So Steinbeck, through Curly's euphemistic response, that way, he leaves us to determine what he means by that phrase. Certainly, though, Curly is suggesting that this is unusual. We've got to work out what, what's going on in Curly's mind when he says that. Is he suggesting some kind of sexual motive on George's part? Or is he just kind of generally bemused by the idea of them travelling together. Finally, Slim. How does he respond? It's very different to how the boss and Curly respond. You guys travel around together? His tone was friendly. It invited confidence without demanding it. Sure, said George. We kind of look out for each other. He indicated Lenny with his thumb. He ain't bright. Hell of a good worker, though. Hell of a nice fella, but he ain't bright. I've knew him for a long time. Slim looked through George and beyond him. Ain't many guys travel around together, he mused. I don't know why. Maybe everybody in the whole damn world is scared of each other. It's a lot nicer to go around with a guy you know, said George. Finally, notice how Slim does not condemn the relationship in the same way as the boss and Curly. The prepositional couplet of through George and beyond him, prepositions through and beyond, they hint at some kind of philosophical contemplation on Slim's part. He thinks about the bigger picture and how this anomaly fits into his understanding of society at the time. He wonders why there are not more partnerships like George and Lenny's. And crucially, 
he doesn't just leave it as a as a kind of sceptical question. He tries to grapple with the reason. Many think this, this statement from Slim, is the thematic centre of the novel, that Slim is almost Steinbeck's voice, asking of 1930s America how it has rendered nomadic workers friendless, lacking in connection and social intimacy. Remember how Steinbeck describes Slim. He possesses an authority that was so great that his word was taken on any subject, be it politics or love. If there is any character who has the seal of Steinbeck's approval when it comes to their attitudes, it's Slim. He actually treats crooks like a human being. He's the one who empathises with Candy when it comes to his dog. And, and ultimately, he's the one who understands George and Lenny's friendship, its necessity and its appeal. Now let's explore how Candy and George share a perception of value and one that differs from the others on the ranch. It's interesting how Carlson speaks about Candy's dog, isn't it? That dog of Candy's is so goddamn old he can't hardly walk. Stinks like hell, too. Every time he comes into the bunkhouse, I can smell him for two, three days. Why'd you get Candy to shoot his old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up? I can smell that dog a mile away. Got no teeth, damn near blind, can't eat. Candy feeds him milk. He can't chew nothing else. In a world in which survival is key, where earning just enough to live on is your only purpose, I imagine you begin to have a lower view of people, because they're just commodities used for their labour. Not only are they exploited by the landowners, but individuals begin to lose a sense of their own humanity. They only understand themselves in those terms as useful for bucking barley bags or um, bringing their work ticket to the next ranch. They, they live in those divisions of time determined by the hours set by the boss or by the next payday. And so Carlson is blind to anything other than Candy's dog's productivity yield. He lists his ailments, uh, the burdens, the problems. He, he cannot see relationship, probably because he has become accustomed to a way of life that doesn't just not require it, but one that it simply cannot coexist with. But Candy is different. There's history here, a sense in which the dog has relational value too. Yeah, I had him ever since he was a pup. God, he was a good sheepdog when he was younger. While I've been trying not to flip forward too far in the novella so that we can explore its ideas chronologically, I think it's worth seeing the parallels with how George speaks about Lenny in the third chapter when he's talking to Slim. This is what George says. Him and me was both born in Auburn. I know his Aunt Clara. She took him when he was a baby and raised him up. When his Aunt Clara died, Lenny just come along with me out working. Got kind of used to each other after a little while. It's the same with Candy's dog, isn't it? George and Lenny go together, like beans and ketchup. The idea of extricating one from the other is absurd because they're united by shared experience, by a relational power that goes beyond practical or even rational behaviour. Carlson cannot understand Candy's dog's worth because he, he cannot see his power, this power, probably because he, he hasn't experienced it himself. Look at how George speaks in plural terms about Lenny and himself. It's down there at the bottom of the screen. George got up and went over to Lenny's bunk and sat down on it. I hate that kind of bastard, he said. I've seen plenty of them. Like the old guy says, Curly don't take no chances. He always wins. He thought for a moment. If he tangles with you, Lenny, we're going to get the can. Don't make no mistake about that. He's the boss's son. Look, Lenny, you try to keep away from him, will you? Don't never speak to him. If he comes in here, you move clear to the other side of the room. Will you do that, Lenny? Steinbeck has George move over to Lenny's bunk, much like a parent might with a child. This is not the kind of relationship that is easily destroyed. And George understands that. Anything Lenny does to get sacked naturally involves both of them. Do you notice? We're going to get the can. And it's this presumption that is at the heart of their relationship. George recognises that Lenny's actions are inextricably tied to his own. Theirs is an unconditional, platonic love that goes beyond the brutal, productivity-driven, nomadic lifestyle that Carlson and the other ranch hands inhabit. Finally, an uncertain confidence sounds like an oxymoron. Why do I say it? Because, of course, 
we have confidence in George and Lenny's relationship. As I said, it seems like a kind of unconditional platonic love that's grounded in something more than duty, that appears to stretch beyond the what-can-you-offer-me selfish motives of many relationships at the time. But simultaneously, we sense that Lenny is a liability, particularly in what is a turbulent social landscape. We're uncertain because we fear that while their friendship is solid, the circumstances in which it exists may bring things to an end with or without their consent. Did you notice that repeated description of their entrance at the beginning of parts one and two? Behind him came George and behind George, Lenny. George is the leader, bearing the burden of responsibility for both of them. George himself recognises this when he says, Yeah, how'd you eat? You ain't got sense enough to find nothing to eat. It is George who carries the work cards, George who does the talking when they first meet the boss, George who makes the plans. It is this dependency on the practical things that really underpins the threat to their relationship. Because as soon as Lenny and, and his behaviour comes into conflict with others' interests and self-preservation, George will be helpless to avoid his demise. We've already seen it, haven't we? Carlson has already levelled that threat against Candy and his dog. Why don't you get Candy to shoot his old dog, he says. Why? Because he stinks. Candy's dog relies on Candy to exist. He isn't offering him anything from a practical, rational point of view apart from companionship. In fact, he actually causes him trouble. And so he depends on Candy. But as soon as Candy's dog infringes on others' interests and others' self-preservation, he can no longer survive. This threat is something we will come back to in the third lecture. The signs of disappointment are there, even at this early stage. It's obvious, isn't it, how similar the relationship between Candy and his dog is to the friendship of George and Lenny. Steinbeck writes, Old Candy, the swamper, came in and went to his bunk, and behind him struggled his old dog. Behind him came George, and behind George, Lenny. This is an unusual relationship. It is rejected by those blinded by a corrupted America, accepted by Steinbeck's voice in Slim, and ultimately leaves us with an uncertain confidence in its future.